I got to give you my five best performing teams of week eight in college football. The first team up. Oh, people are not going to want to hear this team because it, it's not one of those desired playoff logos. It's not one of those logos that anybody expected to be in the college football playoff conversation. And that is Kurt Singetti's Indiana Hoosiers. They played Nebraska. And we played this game up a lot, how important this was for both teams. And we were 100% right about that. However, Indiana had other plans. They were like, yeah, 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 we, we, we know it's important, but uh, it's SmackDown City, 56 to 7. This was a game where, I mean, this was domination from start to finish, but Indiana did get some bad news in this game, which could turn their whole season on its heels. Their quarterback is going to be out for an extended period of time. That means everything's in jeopardy. The second team up, they played on a Friday night. That's the Oregon Ducks. They played versus Purdue. And, and remember, there's a whole video of everybody out here talking about how big of a trap game this is and everything else. Well, Oregon was not falling into the trap, not even a little bit. 35 to nothing over Purdue on the road, short turnaround on it after an emotional high win a, a field storming win against ohio state and then they did not have a letdown at all which is a good sign for the ducks uh number three a team that we have not talked about i don't believe at any point in time this season and that is the duke blue devils they had a win over florida state big ups to malik murphy Big ups to Mike Elko and Manny Diaz. They're doing a good job over there. Um, but why is that important? Because uh, Duke is now six and one. Six and one. So this is more of a cumulative share of love for them as opposed to just beating Florida State, which is a bad football team right now. Uh, the fourth team up, the Georgia Bulldogs. Oh, they went down to Austin and just, and just strangled, literally strangled Texas. They strangled the life out of Texas, and now it has made all of us question Texas. Now, Texas was one of them teams that I thought was elite and that I believed that I trusted. Well, this offensive line showed that they couldn't be trusted against Georgia, and they got overwhelmed. 30 to 15, good job, Georgia Bulldogs. Next team up, oh, them Colorado Buffaloes are back, baby. Travis Hunter was out again so he's missed a lot of time in the last two weeks but it didn't matter 34 to 7 win over arizona in tucson huge win on the road and uh we really got to start giving Deion sanders some flowers right now i know that there was a bunch of talk in the offseason but i believe that when you make noise and when you criticize things that people do when they do things right you got to give them some credit. You do. Next team up, the UCLA Bruins. And I know that this is six teams. I'm violating the, the rules. But you had their head coach, Deshaun Foster, get his first win in conference against Rutgers, 35-32. And it was their first game over 20 points. And they only have one less win than USC right now. So UCLA fans, they're, they're like, well, we ain't taking no gruff from anybody right now. All right, so those were the five best teams who performed in week eight of college football. Now it's time for the worst teams of week eight. Now, I'm telling you, we, we will not talk about Florida State. We will not talk about Florida State, who's now one in six after their 23 to 16 loss to Duke. We shouldn't talk about Florida State, but they're one in six and Duke is six and one. Mike Norvell, first coach to lose to an FCS school over at Florida State. First ever lost to Duke in program history. He has three 0-3 starts in five seasons. And this 1-6 in year five, the worst Florida State record since 1975. And that's the year before Bobby Bowden arrived. And eight-year contract extension, $84 million. I'm just saying, these are just facts, people. Uh, but now it's on to the worst teams of college football in week eight. Uh, first up, 
the Oklahoma Sooners. They lost to South Carolina 35 to 9. 35 to 9. Everybody's been scoring on South Carolina. What is going on out there, Brent Venables? I know that you have a, a true freshman starting at quarterback. I know that your other quarterback that you thought was going to be all world, Jackson Arnold, is not performing at the level that you would have expected. But it's not just them. It's also a combination of the offense. And in this case, you couldn't get stops against South Carolina. I'm just saying. Uh, next up, Alabama. The Alabama Crimson Tide in their 24-17 loss to Tennessee. And you might be saying... George, they played another ranked team. Why are you tripping? It, it, on the worst of the week? Uh, yes. Ask Alabama fans, was this the worst of the week? And they will let you know, yes, this was the worst of the week. And it's not so much that they lost. It's the fact that their offense looks disjointed. Nico Iamalava was not playing great football because they had at least three more touchdowns that were missed wide open. This could have been a, a 45 to 17 game. That's the problem there. It's not just that they lost by seven points. It's that, that they didn't look good on defense or on offense. And we'll get to more of that. Uh, number three, USC. They lost to Maryland. They found a way to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory 29 to 28 Maryland came back storming in the last, what, minute of the game and won? Oh, another heartbreaking loss. And all four of USC's losses, I think, are by 14 points or less. No, I'm talking about cumulatively. Not, not each wins. No, no. They are losing heartbreakers. And their fan base, their heart is broken right now. And number four, Texas. Yes, this was the worst of the week. I know that you were playing Georgia. But you were the number one team in the nation. And you were down, what, like 23 to nothing. Same way that Georgia was to Alabama. You just got overwhelmed. Quinn Ewers was overwhelmed. Then you tried to bring in Arch Manning when it was 20 or 23 to nothing, thinking that was going to change things, putting him in in that spot. That wasn't going to work. You bring Quinn Ewers back. You get a couple touchdowns. Fans throw things on the field, everything in between, but you got overwhelmed. And that is a scary proposition for Texas fans going forward. Because now it's like a boxer. When you get knocked out, now all of a sudden you know it's possible to get knocked out. And that changes life. Uh, the last team, Iowa. They played Michigan State. Michigan State has been a doormat all year. But you know what? Big ups to Aiden Childs. Big ups to their uh their team, their head coaches, their assistant coaches, because they have this team still fighting and they are building things the right way over there. And this Iowa team, multiple personalities, 32 to 20. What are you doing? But they still have no offense, though, even with either personality, because the Minnesota and Washington games, you win those, look great. Offense still whack, but you, you win. And then you have the Michigan State, Iowa State games. You're, you're up and down on offense. This is confusing. You need to figure this out, Iowa. This is not good. And you guys, I want you guys to like, subscribe, get notifications, and tell a friend. So I'm going to give you a second. So if you're watching this on Twitter, go click the YouTube link, subscribe, give it a thumbs up because this is the best college football show around. And I need you guys to share it so we can continue to grow because last week's episode was unbelievable and it's because of you guys. And if you're watching it on uh, YouTube, share, do all those things and leave a thumbs up and leave a comment, leave a comment in the chat, leave a comment down, down the bottom so the algorithm loves us.